as we begin the second year of COVID-19 restrictions on farms, today's webinar explores how to better support temporary foreign workers' freedom of movement. This incl includes the right to move freely off of the job site during off hours and the responsibility to do so safely. We will also be discussing open work permits. To, to start our discussion today, it is my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Rajsekar. Jennifer is the manager of social support service, uh, social support services of the neighborhood organization or TNO, a partner in Kairos's, Kairos Canada's empowering temporary foreign workers during COVID-19 project. Uh, Jennifer will be joined by her colleagues at TNO, uh, Stephanie Mayall and Carolyn Watson. So please. Um, sorry, uh, thank you, David, and thank you, everyone, for um, participating in today's uh, webinar. Um, um, we have a bit of a technical problem in our end uh, at you know, with the server and issues. So this is my third location from the morning, changing one place to another. Um, uh, just wanted to say who we are at uh, TNO. TNO is a service uh, organization, not only for settlement, we also provide uh, services right across uh, from employment, health, housing, and uh, uh, early childhood education. So we provide services from zero to all the way end of life. Uh, uh, support service. Some program we provide throughout Ontario and some nationally. Uh, temporary foreign workers program, uh, we worked in uh, nationally in caregivers program. And we, this is our pleasure working with uh, Kairos as a partner to work with uh, agricultural temporary foreign workers. Um, uh, and hoping that my colleagues Carolyn Watson and uh, Stephanie will share and we'll stay back and answer if you have any other questions. All the materials is it's taken from or provided by Service Canada and shared by Kairos. And um, maybe if you have any questions about TNO, uh, our services uh, in details, we can also connect. Uh, thank you. Maybe Stephanie, you can take over. Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to David, Connie, and Alfredo at Kairos for inviting us here to talk about this important issue today. And thank you to all of you for joining us. So today we're going to be talking about um, temporary foreign workers' freedom of movement. Um, I'm just going to try and get rid of my camera here. Hold on. There we go. So the COVID-19 pandemic requires significant adjustments to address public health imperatives um, made by employers specifically. Um, and the Government of Canada recognizes the extraordinary effort and commitment by employers, government partners, and community organizations to protect the health and safety of temporary foreign workers while they are in Canada. Um, but last year specifically, as the pandemic unfolded, the Government of Canada received numerous allegations that some employers were requiring uh, their temporary foreign work staff to remain on the property where they live and work um, outside of the mandatory quarantine or self-isolation periods. Um, and so in a reaction to that, uh, the Government of Canada provided the following reminders um, and a notice regarding temporary foreign workers freedom of movement. Um, and so the reminders are as follows. So while in Canada, temporary foreign workers have the same rights and protections as Canadians and permanent residents under applicable federal, provincial and territorial labor and employment standards. This is to say that an employer cannot restrict a temporary foreign worker's off-duty conduct, except when, for example, such movement is restricted by a government-issued order, such as those related to states of emergency or public health. So if there's lockdown measures in place for all residents of a region, those would certainly apply to temporary foreign workers. But in a region where there was not those types of measures for residents, temporary foreign workers cannot be made exclusion. Um, you know. So the temporary foreign worker program does not provide employers with the right to limit the free movement of workers, such as movement off the property where workers live and or work. So like all workers, temporary foreign workers are free to run errands, access services and enjoy their time off when not in quarantine, self-isolating or otherwise restricted from doing so as per government laws and orders. 
limiting a temporary foreign workers movement may be considered abuse under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Regulations and is a violation of the temporary foreign worker programs conditions. So examples would include threatening or intimidating a worker to not leave the location where they live or work, imposing policies or agreements, whether they be oral or written, um, coerced or mandated by the employer that restrict a worker's ability to leave their housing or work location. And this includes situations where a worker may feel compelled to agree and or abide by a policy or request out of fear of reprisal. Um, you know, workers signing a paper agreeing to this kind of condition does not make it legal. Um, so physically confining a worker to their housing or work site without a legal authority, such as a government um, or court issued order. So government laws or orders may require employers to implement policies and practices that do restrict a worker's movement, such as within their housing or workplace. But in these cases, employers will be requ required to provide proof to Service Canada that such a policy or practice adheres to laws or orders issued by a government authority. Employers are strongly encouraged to be transparent with their employees about government imposed restrictions on and off the work site and to share relevant records such as public health orders with workers. So in the case that an employer is found to be non-compliant with the temporary foreign worker programs conditions, they could be subject to a series of consequences um, and they range. So starting with warnings, administrative monetary penalties, a temporary or permanent ban from the temporary foreign worker program and international mobility program, the publication of their name and address on the Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada public website with details of the violations and or consequences, so the shame list, um, or the revocation or suspension of previously issued LMIAs or labor market impact assessments. It's also important that workers are aware of and do follow public health requirements and guidelines in order to ensure that they take the steps necessary to minimize uh, risk of infection and spread of COVID when they are out in the community. And there are a variety of resources that um, Service Canada has put together for temporary foreign workers about how to protect themselves and others from COVID-19 through the following links. They are available on um, the government website and I believe that they have just been updated today. Um, with most recent information. Um, so those are important resources for workers to have um, about their responsibilities and what public health measures look like in their community. Now, in a case where a worker is suffering from abuse um, in the workplace, uh, there are a couple of two real recourses. One is the tip line, and I didn't put that up on a slide and perhaps should have, but there is a, a tip line that workers can call to report um, and it can be done confidentially, and that's uh, done federally. But in terms of tangible actions, workers can apply for an open work permit for vulnerable workers. And this is available to workers on employer-specific work permits who are experiencing abuse or who are at risk of abuse. Um, they may be eligible to receive what's called an open work permit that is exempt from the labor market impact assessment process. Um, and in order to qualify, um, abuse has to be proved and abuse consists of any of the following and this is a short list um, and my colleague Carolyn Watson is going to go into a bit more detail in a few moments but so physical abuse including assault and forcible confinement um, as sexual abuse including sexual contact without consent psychological abuse including threats and intimidation and financial abuse including fraud and extortion and so in order to qualify for this permit, uh, workers must produce evidence of abuse. So when applying for the open work permit, the migrant worker must describe the abuse or risk of abuse they face by submitting a letter of explanation. And this um, a letter statement or report from an abuse support organization, a medical doctor, a healthcare professional or other such entity, a sworn statement or affidavit by the applicant, a copy of an official complaint form filed with an enforcement agency, or supporting or additional materials such as a victim impact statement, hard copies of email messages, uh, photos showing injuries or working conditions, as well as witness testimonies. And there's a couple of steps. So applying for an open work permit in a situation of abuse, a worker must apply directly to IRCC for an open work permit by filling out an online application form. 
Um, they must include in their online application supporting evidence, as I just mentioned, of the abuse. They must have a valid work permit that is LMIA required or have a valid work permit that is LMIA exempt and employer specific. Um, and they, they uh, have to be authorized to work without a work permit under implied status as a result of applying for a renewal of one of these types of work permits. And that's it for my portion. I'm gonna now hand over to, um, to Carolyn Watson, another project coordinator who will explain a little bit more about um, the open work permit. Sharing my screen. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, okay, I will try and share my screen now. Um, okay. Hang on just a minute. technology you know well i can do one or the other but i can't do both so okay. <laughs> this is my problem here um okay okay can you see that in um okay okay so i'm going to talk a bit more in detail about the open permit for vulnerable workers. Um, so um, the open work permit for vulnerable workers recognizes that every worker in Canada is entitled to a safe and healthy work environment. Um, so if workers are in an abusive situation, they can apply for an open work permit for vulnerable workers. And this work permit will allow them to work for almost any employer in Canada and its purpose is to help them leave an abusive situation to find a new job. Uh, there's no fee to apply. Um, the permit is temporary, but it should give, you, give them enough time to find a new employer and apply for a new work permit. So it can be issued for up to 12 months. So the goals of the permit are to provide migrant workers who are experiencing abuse or are at risk of experiencing abuse a specific means to leave their employer by obtaining work authorization to work for another employer. And it's also um, aiming to decrease the risk of migrant workers in Canada who leave their jobs and work without authorization as a result of abuse in the workplace. Um, it also aims to facilitate the participation of workers experiencing abuse or at risk of abuse in inspections of their former employer, recruiter, or both. And it also aims to help migrant workers assist authorities if required by reducing the perceived risk and fear of losing a work permit and being removed from Canada. They aren't, uh, migrant workers who apply for this permit are not required to assist authorities in order to obtain the open work permit, but um, they do uh, hope that some of them will. Um, so those who can benefit from uh, the open work permit for vulnerable workers are migrant workers in Canada who hold a valid LMIA required work per permit or a valid LMIA exempt employer specific work permit. So they must be tied to a particular employer in order to apply. Um, migrant workers who have applied for renewal of their employer specific work permit and are currently authorized to work in Canada. Um, so these are people whose uh, current work permits have not expired yet. Um, so the types of things that are considered abuse, I think Stephanie um, went over some of these, but physical abuse, so it does include assault and forcible confinement, and more specifically, um, there's quite a list of uh, things, hitting, beating, slapping, punching, choking, burning, pushing, or shoving a worker in a way that results or could result in injury. Uh, once again, confining a worker, so restricting their freedom of movement. Uh, living conditions in which employer provided accommodations are unsafe or unsanitary or pose a risk to the worker's health. Forcing or pressuring a worker to work under conditions that are unsafe or pose a risk to their health. And forcing a worker to engage in drug or alcohol use or illegal behavior against their will and possibly creating dependencies on that substance. 
Um, sexual abuse, which uh, entails um, quite a number of things as well, such as forcing or manipulating a worker into having sex or performing sexual acts, forcing a worker to perform unsafe or degrading sexual acts, using physical force to compel a worker to engage in a sexual act against their will, using physical force, weapons or objects in non-consensual sexual acts, involving other people in non-consensual acts, exposing, suggesting, attempting or completing a sexual act involving a worker who is unable to understand the nature or condition of the act, unable to decline participation or unable to communicate unwillingness to engage in the sexual act, for example, because of illness, disability, the influence of drugs or alcohol, intimidation or pressure. Um, psychological abuse is also um, considered abuse. So this could be insulting, intimidating, humili humiliating, harassing, threatening, including with respect to immigration status or deportation, name calling, yelling at, blaming, shaming, ridiculing, disrespecting or criticizing a worker. Um, it also includes controlling what a worker can and cannot do threatening a worker with murder, intimidating, threatening or harming a worker with a knife, gun or other object or weapon, and using religious or spiritual beliefs to manipulate, dominate or control a worker. Um, financial abuse could include willfully or repeatedly not paying wages owed to the worker, stealing or taking a worker's money, salary, checks or coercing them into giving, giving these things up, controlling or limiting the worker's financial resources, withholding money or credit cards, exploiting a worker's financial resources, requiring a worker to deposit money into their bank account for fraudulent purposes, closely monitoring how a worker spends money, destroying a worker's property, spending a worker's money without their consent. So how abuse could look may look in the workplace. The employer, recruiter, or both may have coerced the migrant worker into paying job placement and recruitment fees. The migrant worker is repeatedly harassed, for example, unwanted physical or verbal behavior that is offending or humiliating by a coworker in the workplace. The migrant worker is threatened by their employer if they complain about their work conditions. The migrant worker has egg exited an abusive situation, but would be at risk if the, of the abuse if they returned. Um, it could also look like forcing or pressuring the migrant worker to perform work that goes against the conditions of their work permit, such as working for a different employer than stated on the permit or performing different job duties. Um, recognizing that this jeopardizes a worker's status in Canada is a form of coerced engagement in illegal activity and may be accompanied by or enable further threats, intimidation and abuse. Um, the migrant worker may not be directly experiencing abuse, but may be in a situation where their coworkers are being abused by their employer. And this puts them at risk of experiencing an abusive situation. And there are specific um, contexts uh, or specific types of abuse in the context of COVID-19. Um, so the employer willfully does not provide wages owed during the mandatory quarantine or isolation period upon entry to Canada. And this is required of employers under the temporary foreign worker program and international mobility uh, program. Um, or if the employer tries to recuperate the wages from the worker um, during this time. Um, if workers are forced or pressured to perform work that violates the conditions of a mandatory quarantine or isolation period under federal or provincial jurisdiction during this time. Um, and also if they're forced, oops, if they're forced to or pressured to work when showing symptoms of COVID-19, that's considered abuse. Um, forcing workers or pressuring them to work with co-workers who should be in quarantine or symptomatic or are symptomatic of COVID-19 is also considered abuse. Um, preventing workers from seeking medical assistance, not providing workers with adequate tools and working conditions to implement public health and social distancing protocols as instructed by the chief public health officer or provincial health authorities is considered abuse and retributive action taken against workers um, for taking sick leave or refusing to work in unsafe working conditions, um, which also includes uh, termination is considered abuse during this uh, particular context. Um, 
abusive living conditions are also considered part of uh, an abusive situation. So an employer who does not provide appropriate and adequate accommodations for quarantining, self-isolation or prevention of virus spread um, is considered abuse. And this would include not providing separate accommodations for workers who are subject to quarantine and workers who are not and failing to provide accommodations that allow workers quarantine together to respect requirements of the quarantine period, including maintaining appropriate distance from other persons and avoiding contact with vulnerable populations. Um, it would also include failing to provide accommodations that allow for isolation in the event that a worker becomes symptomatic. Um, this would include a private, um, needing a private bedroom and bathroom and failing to provide workers with cleaning products to prevent the spread in shared accommodations. Um, so the, if the employer prevents workers from obtaining essential items during the quarantine or isolation, such as groceries or medication, um, or fails to provide adequate arrangements, uh, such as assisting with pickup or delivery, this is also considered abuse. Now there's a um, particular category that is um, part that would enable workers to apply for a vulnerable work permit that falls under trafficking. And it's um, a little bit more of a complicated situation, but uh, it would involve three key elements. Um, so it has to involve a physical act. So the recruitment, transportation or harboring of a person. Um, it has to be accomplished through means. So through threats, force, coercion or deception. And it has to be for a specific person, a specific purpose, such as violate ex exploitation of victims. Um, there's quite a bit more detail on this issue. So if this is something that um, is a concern for anyone, it would be useful to actually just, um, you know, put the worker in, in contact with someone who can assist more specifically. Um, so in terms of applying for the open work permit, I think Stephanie mentioned this, there are two, two things that need to be done. Um, so the worker must apply directly to Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada for an open work permit online. And they must include in their application supporting evidence of the abuse, um, which I'll go into a little more detail in a minute. Um, applications for the open work permit for vulnerable workers have to be made in Canada. So they cannot be made at a port of entry. Um, with CBSA or, or Canada Border Services Agencies. Um, and the evidence that they accept with the application. So a letter, statement or report from an abuse support organization, a medical doctor, a healthcare professional or other such entity, a sworn statement or an affidavit by the applicant, and a copy of an official complaint filed with an enforcement agency. So this could be um, police or CBSA, um, or an, a copy of an official complaint completed by the migrant worker and submitted to a provincial enforcement agency, such as an employment standards uh, branch. They also look for supporting or additional materials, such as victim impact statements, hard copies of email messages, photos um, showing injuries or working conditions, and witness testimonies. Um, part of the application will involve an interview, or at least it could involve an interview. Um, the immigration officers may choose to interview the worker and this is up to their discretion, so it may or may not happen. Arrangements can be made directly with the worker or with the worker's representative, such as a lawyer. Um, and as I said, it is up to the discretion of the uh, processing agent whether they will interview. Uh, but it could be done in person, it could be done online or done, done via phone, or they could just waive the interview. Um, Family members who are currently in Canada are also eligible to obtain an open work permit if the main, if the principal applicant, um, so the worker, has been issued an open work permit under the program. Uh, family members would have their work permits issued under the same program as the worker and for the same duration as the worker. So this is the principal applicant, the main uh, person who was issued the work permit in the first place. Um, and the, it would be until the expire, uh, it would be in the same duration or the expiry of the passport, um, whichever is earlier. Dependent children who are of working age are also eligible to obtain an open work permit under the same program and for the same duration. Um, new visitor or study permits may also be issued for dependent children of the worker currently in Canada if they are accompanying uh, the principal migrant worker. 
um, and family members are also exempt from paying the fees. So because this application is so complex and requires um, a considerable amount of documentation, it is important that anyone considering this application seek legal counsel. Um, legal advice and rep representation can be obtained through a variety of um, areas. Legal Aid Ontario is probably the, um, one of the best uh, places to start. In the case of women, the Assaulted Women's Helpline may be useful as well. Um, Canada Border Services Agency and IRCC also um, state that they will support these applications, but it's more in terms of technical support rather than um, providing a lot of assistance. And it, for people who don't speak English or French, um, it's going to be quite difficult to navigate these, um, these services. Um, there is also the tip line that Stephanie mentioned that I didn't put down either, um, but that might also be useful. And thank you. And I think if anyone have questions to ask, or also we just wanted to uh, talk about uh, when you are helping with uh, applications or when we are engaging employees uh, uh, to be uh, safety and safety of the employers. employees is also important. So unless you know and aware of all the circumstances, how you are engaging them, so to put them in at risk. So we thought, uh, well, to find the right referrals and navigating the system with clients to make sure that their safety is also important uh, uh, before we provide the services and uh, to to put that as because it's not simple as each individual cases might be different uh, and to make sure that we are doing it in a safer way to protect the client. Thanks so much to everyone from TNO. That was very informative. It's a lot to take in, but I think it's really important information to have, especially when considering um, the specific um, instances of COVID-19, but also looking at the broader picture of um, the freedom of moving between job sites, uh, but also um, the particular uh, issue of movement in a time of COVID when um, when there are stay-at-home orders that would seem to support um, keeping people on specific sites. So it's good to know that uh, it's good to affirm that there is that ability to leave the, the site and uh, needs to be that ability to um, travel outside of just being on the farm site for the entire season. Um, we're gonna take a few questions while we have all three of our TNO presenters here. So if anybody has um, questions arising from those presentations before we move on to our next presenter. Um, oh, uh, we have one from Susan. Yes, it just seemed to me that the consequences to employers we're kind of like, oh darn, <laughs> you know, they they don't seem very serious. And at the same time, it did appear to me pretty challenging to a worker who who has who is experiencing abuse to quote prove it. I mean, I think it's good that it includes making a statement, but even having to notarize it seems a bit challenging, you know. So I don't know. Can you comment on that? kind of <clears throat> apparent imbalance there. Yeah, I think I think everyone who, you know, works with this, works in um, any aspect of immigration, um, there's consensus that this is an important step, but it really doesn't solve the, the issues. Um, you know, there's still a lot of room for abuse because there isn't a lot of, um, you know, regulation of the, the workplace. Um, so there aren't enough inspections um there's just not a lot of oversight and there the onus there is a huge onus on the worker to you know do all of this while being abused so they're you know concerned they're afraid they're worried and yet they have to go and track down all this information and make all these statements and produce evidence and things like that so 
I mean, I think in terms of what we can do, we can support them should they want to do this um, in terms of, you know, helping with logistics, whether that's, uh, you know, getting to a legal aid clinic to make an affidavit, um, collecting evidence, um, explaining, you know, uh, the steps involved in that kind of thing. But um, yeah, it, it's it's still, you know, very difficult and, and um, you know, we're even now we're hearing things and people don't want to report because they're afraid. So, you know, they know that it's happening and they know that they're being abused, but uh, they're going to stick it out uh, because they, you know, they need the job at the end of the day. Thanks. And uh, now in this season, we are working through a lot of people. Clearly, you, if you look at the list, so many of them are, we all know it's violated, right? Whether it's housing condition, living condition related to COVID, there were so many. But when you've given them the information to the workers and, and at the end, they said, no, I, I will, like Carolyn mentioned that I, I rather not to stick it because they worried about their income. Second thing is also they might not have get a chance to come back again. They've been threatened by and 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 so that's why we need to be very, very careful before we put we need to explain to the workers what the situation is going to be, giving all the information, all the resources possible to make them um, the decision. So uh, to to because sometimes the workers also might have um, uh, collecting evidence, it's not that easy uh, to prove sometimes. So uh, we are hearing a lot of time and we also encouraging them to, to call the tip line to, to uh, report. Um, but uh, at the end, they say, oh, I will, I will take it as go and one day at a time sort of thing. But it's, it's sad to see. That seems so. I have a question. It's Caroline from TNO as well. That was a great presentation, you guys. Thank you so much. I just wonder, is there more um, uh, regulations we can advocate to put onto the employers um, so they're compliant and uh, it reduces the, the situations where there um, is you know, abuse happening? I don't know if that's one perspective. And the other thing I'm just wondering from what you guys are hearing, is there a lot of situations where you mentioned the accommodation that allows for isolation? I'm wondering if you're hearing um, a lot of that is, is an issue for the migrant workers. Thank you. So thanks for that question, Paralyn. One of the issues around employer compliance is that many of the conditions that qualify as abuse are in fact compliant with the housing guidelines because they themselves are so loose um, and so uh, inadequate and there's legis the legislation around them isn't really legislation, it doesn't have much teeth. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's one of the issues. Uh, and then when it comes to issues of abuse in the context of COVID, we know that that can manifest itself differently in a work environment versus a living environment. And then we're looking at whether that's a ministry of labor um, and you know, so there, it's the fractioning off of inspection spaces too that is part of the problem. Some of the protections of workers fall through those gaps. Um, if an inspector from the public health department is coming to look at the condition of housing and not able or doesn't have the mandate to or the checkbox on the clipboard to look at other things on the site, um, then those gaps, they're not just codified in the ways that the program is administered, but the real life consequences are that there are invisible areas that this mm -hmm. kind of abuse thrives in. Um, and so employer compliance, unfortunately, can still be, you know, em compliant employers can be providing conditions that meet abusive standards. Um, so that's the one part. And what was the second part of your question? And I'm sorry. Um, Just wondering about like um, the accommodation, you know, employers are required to uh, provide accommodation to allow for isolation, if that's a real challenge mm -hmm. and not happening or what. what it's a real challenge. Yeah, it's a challenge in two ways. It's a challenge for employers logistically, operationally, and actually mm -hmm. to source the space and find the ways to adhere to these protocols. But from the worker perspective, the powerlessness of being a, a worker patient who's moved around from one location to another, depending on the results of one test or another, has mm -hmm. given rise to an incredible mental health catastrophe for workers who find themselves arriving under scary and intimidating conditions. And then they themselves or a coworker 
en route has now found themselves to test positive and farms then scramble to then parse out and isolate everybody individually, which then when you're struggling already with these mental health transitions, now you're all alone. And in some cases with farm workers, that looks like all alone in a rural area with no Wi-Fi and no ability to access not just family and forms of support, but ways of sourcing information that might quell your fears as well. And then enter in language barriers and other power dynamics. And it makes quarantine and isolation a very, very, very distressing situation for many of our worker friends. Um, thank you, David. Thank you, Stephanie, Carolyn, and, and Jenny for the, pre for the presentation. It's, it's really, really very informative. And I just want to add a little bit of a context too, in terms of where these regulations or this, you know, uh, came from. Uh, the Open Work for, Mid for Vulnerable Workers actually came about in 2018 or 2019 when, you know, uh, the Live and Caregiver Program or the pilot program has been changed because of the, or, or uh, updated because of the, you know, uh, the, basically the complaints and you know the experiences that uh, caregivers have had with their employers particularly since they are you know alone in the house with the employers right uh, but within the context of covid uh, this is very much tied to the freedom of mobility because we're hearing a lot that you know during the outbreak uh, farmers or employers started to impose uh, this condition for workers not being allowed to go out of the farms you know that it actually impacted their ability to buy their own food to send money to their families to the countries where they're from and other you know all other uh, aspects of their rights to be able to do those things so um it is really true it is very true that you know uh the honors of proving that you are abused and being able to access this open work permit really lies on the workers. And we've done a lot of advocacy around this and saying that this is not going to work because we know for a fact that workers are not going to, to complain because their, their work permit and employment is tied to the employers. And what if upon investigation, the abuse is not proven to be true? So that worker is tied to go back to the employer and, and suffer the consequences, right? Um, so a part of the project, you know, that, uh, that we are doing now is providing that support, you know, uh, to the workers, uh, making them... Uh, understand and build the capacity to be able to say so that they are abused and their mobility is curtailed. And again, the, the support should come from, from us, uh, from community organizations and so forth. Because as, we, as we've seen from Stephanie and Carolyn's presentation, the list of what they need to do and the list of what they need to prove is, is very intimidating. Uh, so, so I guess it is a challenge, you know, to all of us, how to provide, how to provide this accompaniment so that these are not just uh, things on papers or policies on papers, but that really workers who are under these situations and facing challenges and difficulties are, are provided support and being able to exercise uh, their rights. So it's, it's, it's you know, uh, leading us back to now that, you know, uh, employers can also say that, oh, uh, this, you know, we're not allowing them to, to go out uh, so that they, 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 they won't get it infected and bring it to the bank house and then it will infect everyone. Uh, but, but there's that fine line, right, in terms of protection and curtailment of their mobility or their freedom or right to mobility. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Connie. Um, we are going to take more questions uh, in a little bit, but our uh, next speaker is here. Uh, so welcome, 
Max Scott. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Uh, Max Scott works for the multi-ethnic law firm Carranza LLP as an immigration consultant and is a member of No One is Illegal and the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. In his spare time, Mac enjoys spending time with his family, his collective house, happy hour, science fiction, and bad suits, not necessarily in that order. Thank you so much for coming today. And here is Max Scott. Hi. Hi, folks. It's an honor to be here. I had a lot of respect for Kairos over decades, actually. Um, I used to uh, live in a collective house, actually, with the, one, of the, one of the former EDs of Kairos. Um, Connie, that was very educational, what, you're, what you were saying. To be honest, I missed a lot of the TNO presentation because uh, I had a client in. But I feel like in a lot of ways, you, you guys probably know more than I do. So I hope that what I'm going to add in won't be uh, counterproductive. Because I'm going to talk from the law side. And, and then also from the activist side. So I, I was focusing on what's happening to workers. Um, I thought it was really interesting that you were talking about the and Connie, and I think this was you, about the, the new open work permits for workers who are being exploited. And everything you said hits head on. And what's, what struck to my mind when you were talking is that it's the same with the uh, new open work per, or the, the, the new temporary resident permits for women who are survivors of abuse, in that even though the website looks really nice, it takes a lot, a lot of ideas from you know women, women's abuse groups. Um, and just like the work permit, you still have to prove it. And that's really, really a daunting task. And in the end, like I've actually been working with one of the, and it's the same as well, I should add, for the tra human trafficking uh, temporary re resident permits, which are permits that allow you a temporary status that allows you to get a work permit, an open work permit, and can allow you to get healthcare. And I've been working with one of the, um, people may not remember this, but there's a famous case up in Barrie, um, and I've been working with one of the uh, one of the the, the 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 people who went through the trafficking there. And even though two police forces have laid charges of trafficking, uh, she was refused a temporary resident permit because the immigration officer decided there wasn't enough proof that somehow they could second guess the cops, and that there wasn't enough proof that there had actually been trafficking. So you're also talking like if it's a very it's a very discretionary instrument. Any of these three, whether it's those temporary work resident permits or the open work permit for people who've been, you know, um, mistreated by their employers. It's a discretionary instrument, which means if you get the wrong officer, you get denied. And the person next to you in line with the same story may, may get accepted. So, you know, I think there needs to be some kind of oversight on this because you're talking about very serious cases. And I mean, much like CBSA, there really is no oversight at the Immigration Refugee Citizenship Canada. So I hope this isn't too off topic. I was going to go into mobility um, of workers. So technically, mobility rights are guaranteed by Section 6 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But what it says in there specifically speaks to permanent residents and citizens. However, because of the famous case Singh, the Charter does apply in a limited context to foreign nationals and temporary residents, would, which would include workers. Now, the way, of course, they avoid this is they tie everything to the employer. And I think, uh, TNO, you probably spoke about this at length, so I won't get into it much, but you know, they're not saying you can't travel to BC. They're just saying that you'll lose your work permit because you won't be with your employer who's on your work permit. It basically becomes indentured labor. Um, and I'm sure TNO touched on this, but for almost all temporary workers in non-professional uh, jobs or skilled jobs, there is no pathway to permanent resident status. Only caregivers have a pathway to permanent residency, and that pathway is very difficult. They have to prove language, and it's a high language bar. Um, they have to have a post-secondary credential. And the only reason that they even have the right to permanent residency is because over 20 to 30 years, they've been fighting, they've been organizing, and they won those rights through their organizing. And I was gonna take you, I, can I share my screen here? Or no, I don't know if I can. Uh, share uh, screen. Yeah. Yep. Okay, hang on. I've been doing a lot of work with uh, this group. 
um, which is part of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change. And these are caregivers and former caregivers, and they are speaking out, they're hiring, and they are also doing casework. So I've had a number of referrals from them. Um, and they're doing their best to help caregivers get, get status. But I wanted to put this up there because I think one of the most inspirational struggles I've ever seen in my 25 years of doing immigration law and immigrant rights work has been in Canada has been the uh, caregiver, the caregiver organizing and they, they win, they win all the time. Uh, moving along. So the problem is with this employer and I'm sure TNO went into this, but with the employer dependent work permits is that foreign workers are stuck in a job. If they complain or unionize or harassed or sexually harassed, they can lose their work permit and have to leave Canada. And I can't tell you how many clients I've had referred to me through the Caregiver Action Center, which were women who are being sexually harassed by their boss. It's not as bad now because they're not required to live in the home, but they're still in a very vulnerable position uh, with men when they're, when they're working as an in-home caregiver. So, you know, you're talking about a lot of problems. And I know you guys talked about the whole thing with the problem with, with, with seasonal agricultural workers and other workers who speak out about their employer. So it, this really basically limits and controls their mobility rights. Now, COVID's been hard. I'm sure not any, all of us have experienced the side effects, whether having had it, having a friend, coworker, loved one get it, knowing someone who died, or even just the mental health effects of living under lockdown. But for a farm worker who's told that they can't leave the farm in areas where because of the seasonal agricultural worker program, infection rates are very high. And I'll bring you to a, another, sorry, um, another website. Hang on. Sorry, I'm not very good with technology. Oh, good, you can see it. So this is the Windsor and Essex County, which is one of the largest farm worker areas. This is their, their stats. And I can't pull, yesterday I tried to pull up the map and I couldn't do it, but they're, they're, in, they're in lockdown, the same way we are, they're in gray. So when you're there, and I mean, TNO talked about this better than I did, you can't send money to your family, Sometimes you're being forced to work, even though you're supposed to be in quarantine, where quarantine is basically almost impossible because you're living in shacks. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely, extremely difficult. Now, originally, farm workers were told that they couldn't leave the farm. My understanding is that that's been eased. But the flip side, what they're doing now is they're stopping workers from coming. Um, what they're saying is you can't come unless you get the vaccine and unless you can afford three days in a hotel once you get to Canada. And the employers, as I understand it, and people from TNO can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the employers are largely not paying for those hotel visits. And as they said earlier, the hotels are pretty much completely booked in, in the farm worker areas. So, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about being unable to even have somewhere to quarantine. Now, in the good news, they can now access the vaccine. <clears throat> but yeah, in the bad news, <clears throat> I'll bring you to an article here. Um, the COVID testing rules are keeping migrant farm workers out of Canada. So they're kind of, you know, they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. At first, we wanted them so badly that we were forcing them to work, even though they should have been in quarantine. And now we're saying, well, you can't come unless you are willing to pay for your own quarantine and your own mandatory testing um, before you come. So these are exorbitant, as Chris says, and Chris is a wonderful guy from Justicia. The, the, these, are, these are exorbitant costs and the risks that they're taking to their health to get the test are simply not acceptable. And you know, and they're basically being asked to take these risks in order to go to come to Canada and feed their families. And, you know, it's, it's just not right. 
Now, I think in your, you know, when you emailed us about coming about speaking, um, <coughs> you asked about solutions. And I'm going to bring you to the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change uh, section on, on farm workers. Um, and the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change is an Ontario wide group of uh, migrant workers. And they have a whole section on farm workers. And as you can see here, they have farm workers speaking out. They have posts. They've been doing demonstrations. But one of the things they call for is not only, you know, to, to expand the mobility freedom, to expand the rights on the job under a work permit, but what they're really calling for, and I believe this is the right, right way to go, is permanent residency on arrival. And permanent residency on arrival would mean that foreign workers would have the same rights as, as anyone in this country. They would have the right to move. They would have the right to, to, to leave. They may be put on conditions that they have to work in a specific industry, much like the open work permits that uh, in-home caregivers are getting. But they would still have many more rights than they have now. And we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be dealing with this three-tier system that we have in this country. Well, actually, it's four-tier of like citizens at the top of the pyramid, permanent residents underneath, foreign workers, under, foreign workers, students, foreign uh, visitors underneath, and non-status people at the bottom. And of course, indigenous people somewhere else, but also pretty much at the bottom. So giving them permanent residency on arrival would help to break down that pyramid. And I think it's not only best for the workers, but I think having a society that has different tiers of rights isn't help, helpful or healthy for anyone. I mean, if we look at the fact that uh, right now it's extremely difficult for non-status people to get vaccinated in, in Toronto because they're still asking for OHIP and ID, we're looking at something that endangers the whole community, not just those non-status people. And those non-status people have human rights and human dignity as well. So the Migrant Works Rights Network, or sorry, the <laughs> Migrant Workers Alliance for Change and the Caregiver Action Center are both part of a group that I'm part of through my group known as Legal called the Migrant Rights Network. And this is their website. Uh, they have a petition here. Um, I can actually put their website in the chat if people want, because then you can see it. No, oh, it doesn't want to let me do the chat while I'm sharing screen. I'll have to stop sharing screen. Late. Oh, wait, here we go. Okay, I'm going to have to stop sharing a bit. Um, and yeah, they're, 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 they're saying that the seasonal agricultural worker program needs to be, needs to be changed. Um, they, they put that out on the 55th anniversary of the program on March 31st, uh, just last week. Uh, they are also saying that, you know, the closing of the borders is, has not been good for refugees and migrant workers and international students. And that we need to make sure that there's vaccines for all people, regardless of status. And that can be as, you know, that can be as convoluted, I guess, as like asking for the ID, even though there is no real requirement under law for them to get, have an ID, can scare people from going in. The fact that the Ministry of Health, despite our demands, has refused to say whether they will share information with Canada Border Services Agency, um, all these create fear which means that people don't go in for the vaccines. So I would encourage people to check out the Migrant Rights Network website. Um, I would also encourage people, oh, look, someone else did it. Thanks, Sean. Um, and, uh, and I would encourage people to get active because we can do more together. I'm not sure if Kairos is a member of the Migrant Rights Network, but it, it would be something to look into if you're not and any of your organizations. And uh, barring further questions, as we say in the court, <laughs> I, I'm good. Thank you so much. What was the organization you talked about before the Migrant Rights Network? I think it was uh, There the... was two. There's the Caregivers Action Center and there's the Migrant Wor Workers Alliance for Change. I'll get you their websites okay. and I'll put them in the chat. Sorry, I'm not very good with technology. Yes, technology has been giving us trouble all day. <laughs> but you know, 
we'll it's a constant into. thing these days, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for uh, for speaking on this. I think you raised a lot of really important points, and um, it's great to have uh, places to go to uh, for us as individuals to participate, but also uh, sort of expanding the network of supports as well. So yeah, yeah, thank you so and much. I mean, any any. Sorry, just one small other yeah, thing. Of course. Any any changes that have ever come in a positive way to immigration legislation in this country have been because of struggle. And we can we can do it. Absolutely. All right. So if anybody has questions, um, you can do as Connie has just done, and we'll get to her in a second. But you can raise your hand uh, by clicking on participants, and I believe, uh, or. I think in the reactions as well, you can also raise your hand um, or you can put your questions in the chat and I will move them from the chat into the um, into the main discussion. So um, Aswani, we're gonna take your question right after Connie, if you wanna go ahead, Connie. Thank you, Mac. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Um, just, just to respond to your question, actually, Kairos, you know, has been a huge supporter of the Migrant Rights Network in terms of, you know, its campaign, uh, the Status for All and Status Now campaign. Great. And the vaccine and so on and so forth. Uh, I've been, you know, prodding uh, Hussan, you know, for Kairos to become a member is apparently uh, the membership committee hasn't met yet. So there is that. Um, I also no. say that, you know, um, I was one of the uh, founding, you know, of the Caregivers Action Center. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> Sorry. You know, it's, it's good. It's good. So, yeah, just, just to reiterate what you said, that many of, you know, the changes that we are seeing now, how... However, you know, despite the shortfalls and so forth, uh, this all came about because of the advocacy, uh, the, the courage of the workers, the caregivers to speak up and have their plight known and be able to get, you know, uh, support from allies and supporters. And, and I think, you know, we need more of this as uh, COVID-19 continues and workers' vulnerability has increased, uh, not only in terms of their employment, but also uh, the toll on their mental health. And, and I think this is what, you know, what we are doing right now as part of the webinar ser series is to uh, raise awareness and uh, on the conditions and context of these workers and how we as allies, you know, privileged citizens and permanent uh, residents uh, would be able to support. Yeah. that, Connie, uh, as well, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I think it's very important what Connie has mentioned. Uh, like we, as an allies, we can help them because this group is a very vulnerable group and it has been vulnerable group for many years. Um, to be aware of the rights, to be aware of what can they do. It might, like, I mean, education is everything, right? Sometimes I feel like if they don't say something, it's because uh, they don't really know the rights. They don't really know the paths. Um, that's one part but um, that I wanted to mention. But the other one, I have a question for, for Mac. Mac, um, yep. so you were talking about the pyramids of uh, who is on the top, like citizenships. But I didn't, um, I have always wondered like refugees. Refugees have a lot mm -hmm. of rights and a lot of like uh, support. Uh, I have always wondered how cannot uh, migrant farm workers can be put in some kind of that situation mm -hmm. that refugees have, right? Uh, and they pay taxes and they paid uh, they pay their, they their, their taxes and all of that. So I'm always wondering about that. I don't know if you can please clarify my question. Sure. Why is not that possible to another channel for migrant farm workers? I mean, uh, this might sound a little bit, uh, a little bit um, conspiracy theorist, but I think the idea is with all foreign workers, 
is to keep them in a vulnerable position so that we can easily exploit them to do jobs that Canadians and permanent residents don't want to do. Even permanent residents are often put into, you know, jobs that they're overqualified for or not even in their stream. You know, we all know the story of the doctor who's driving a taxi cab. Um, I think the idea is actually to have different strata of society so that they can force people into doing the really menial, terrible jobs and force people into situations where the employer can really, really control them. Um, and then I also think there's a certain amount of, well, a large amount of racism in that, you know, Canadian immigration policy was extremely open until people of color started coming to this country. And it was only when people of color started coming at the end of the 19th century that they started doing restrictive and punitive immigration laws. And I think they want to pretend that's not going on because we're a wonderful multicultural country, but there's still a lot of that. Um, you know, I mean, Connie would know this better than me, but when they first started the caregiver program, the Philippines would boast that their biggest export to Canada was, was women. And the seasonal agricultural program comes similarly to that, that program. Um, it comes from an, an agreement between Canada and, and different countries in the Caribbean um, to basically import workers. So I think it's hard. Also, just I would say, and I, I agree with you, refugee claimants and refugees have lots of rights. But I think the reason that happens is because Canada likes to boast about its record in being someone who accepts ref refugees. You know, you have um, Justin Trudeau go on the news with that, that young Syrian woman to show how welcoming and open we are. The, the story that never gets told is that there's every day Canada Border Service Agency is working to interdict which is to stop people from coming here to make a refugee claim in the first place. And that the number of refugees we bring in as sponsored refugees, either through our local church or a mosque or a synagogue or our organization is a drop in the bucket compared to what third world, like global South countries are bringing. I think it's Jordan, Egypt and, and uh, the Sudan take millions of refugees. We take about 15,000 a year. That's, that's overseas, like sponsored from overseas. So, you know, I think refugees do have a lot of rights, but I think that's also because that, I think it's a PR exercise. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be um, overly conspiracy theorist. Um, Thank you so much. Can, can I just add, just wanted to add a um, uh, thing with the caregivers and NTNO you know, is a big part of uh, mobilizing caregivers and we are part of uh, the new pathways advocacy we did. And, and speaking about that, <clears throat> we are standing in front of the uh, committee on April 12th uh, regarding caregivers, uh, LMIA okay. and the pathways. And we are presenting the challenges. Uh, we were involved in caregivers program since 2006 heavily and advoca advocating on behalf of caregivers. And, and I just wanted to say, and we, even though we prepared our speech and given, but we can always tweak in the last minute. And if anyone wanted to share any thoughts on that too, uh, we can definitely do. And we are three of us are presenting in front of the committee on, on April 12th regarding the, oh, the challenges they have to pa go through, passing through the LMIA and the language test and all that. So I thought I'll just put it through. <laughs> Put it, and Connie is aware of it, and she is, <clears throat> and um, part of our ongoing with caregiver challenges and what difficult it costs to become a permanent resident. Uh, even the new pathways cause a lot of challenges and anxiety among people, uh, the caregivers. So, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, I'm going to take uh, Anna's question, and then. Hola, hi, I'm Same. from uh, BC, here in Surrey, BC, and I just had uh, to share an experience that happened to me last week. Uh, we had, I work for the Migrant Worker, worker pro Project, and I go and visit the farm workers, not that at the, at the farms. We had a food uh, box program that we bring food to them every week. And last uh, Monday, I had the experience, I was there waiting for them to come and load the boxes no, from my car. And one of the supervisors just came and said, what are you doing here? The 
honor or the the honor of the fam say that's what are you here like I was I feel intimidated and I was scared of what's going on but I, I explained that we are from options program and we bring food and everything but that's how they they intimidate workers that's how they and, and they are in a very remote area that they cannot go to the super and they cannot go and buy their food like they maybe I don't know how they are getting the food but we are coming to support them with food no every mm-hmm. week and that was experience that's, that's uh, and they were scared because they saw him talking to me they were coming they stopped no and they didn't want to uh, come and they just wait for him to leave and I was like that's not fair like he's going home he's going to be in contact with their family and then he's coming back tomorrow to work he can be one of the had the virus and come to work and he can pass it to other people, but not how he can is allowed to go because, and I don't know, I was so like a little bit mad at after because I said like, that's not fair that they tell the farm workers not to go out when the local workers can go home, be with their family and come back to work the next day. And I don't know, that was something that I, I experienced, no? and I was like, like they had the right, like they have to be careful, like, like to go and take all the precaution that we have to take, but they can go to the store. They can, they don't have to feel like a scared if someone come and bring them food, food, or they someone come and bring anything else, or they can go out, no, but they are intimidating, intimidating uh, workers. That's what, that's my feeling, no, and, and other farms that, because I work with a few farms, are different. Like they even call me, like you say, those people are in quarantine. Can you help them? Like other employers are different, but some employers are like, I don't know, that happened to me. And I can, I don't know how they, maybe that the way that he tried to intimidate me, that's how it works for the workers. No, and they don't know the English. They don't know. They are scared that they will send back home. And sometimes like, no, it's not because they don't know their rights because it's because they don't know English. They don't know how to express. They don't know how to communicate and how to say like, they are scared, no? That's, that's I think that's, that's going on with uh, a few farm workers, no? That they can know. And even one day we had a focus group and we asked if they will tell us or tell the government if they were abused. And they say no, because they are scared to send back home. And they need to provide for their family back home, no? And that's something that they will never say that's what's going on because they need to work. And that's something that I just want to share what happened that day because I'm still <laughs> dealing with that, no? Like, because I was like, I don't know, it's, I got scared. Can you imagine how they scared they can get when they said, like, intimidate them or say, you cannot do this? Like, I think it's, it's hard, no? Okay, thank you just to share that. Thank you, Anna. Um, do any of our speakers want to, anything emerging from that or, yep, you can go ahead. Mike. Just that was very uh, brave of you to share that. And unfortunately it happens all the time. It's like it, if it was one isolated case, one bad apple. But I mean, I know also here in, in Ontario, Justicio workers who have to be really careful about how they, they meet with farm workers, uh, MWAC, Workers in the Niagara region have to be extremely careful about, you know, they going, they can't really go to the farms. And when they do, they often get the same, like similar treatment. It's really, really wrong. I'm sorry that happened to you. I just want to build on um, that because it does segue nicely into some of the other things that we need to think about in the context of empowering workers with information when they're in a situation that materially and politically and actually disempowers them to exercise those rights. And so even though, you know, we should be able to, in a situation outside of a lockdown, make those kinds of deliveries in a contactless way that adheres to public health, we know that employers are very resistant to having anyone come near the farm and will invoke, you know, trespassing laws. Um, so then there becomes this blurred line between, you know, not having visitors or not receiving goods. Um, we've heard all over the province last year that workers couldn't even receive drop-offs. Um, and some of the food items that we were dropping off had to be repackaged and left curbside and so that employers would not be um, inflamed by the presence of others um, 
you know, and even in cases sometimes where the employer would be operating a larger farm saying, okay, if you have locals that you're connected to who are bringing things, they can bring it to me and I'll give it to you. You just have all your local advocate friends come right to my office and yeah, so I interact with me and I'll be sure you get those goods and services that you've asked for. Um, and so I think part of this, the, the pandemic has really exposed, but not just exposed, but really intensified the power dynamics on the farm. So even when we know that, you know, having your workers stay on farm and not receive visitors and not have access to these essential goods qualifies as abuse, violates human trafficking laws, the actual mechanisms by which we could remedy that on an individual level requires systemic change. And that's not what's, um, what's on the table right now. And so we do actually have to exercise a little bit of caution in how we approach our worker friends in, in suggesting things like the open work permit for vulnerable workers, because we need to also remember while well, that is being processed, they may mm -hmm. find themselves living on the very same farm that they're trying to escape for yes. not having any other housing accessible to them, depending on where they are. Um, and then there's, as I think Connie mentioned or Jennifer mentioned, there may be, depending on the sending country, repercussions in the following year. So even if that open work permit is processed and they are granted the permit and there's a new employer that can use them for the rest of the year, they may find themselves just not called back next year because there's so much put on the relationship between the employer and their workforce and the ability for employers to name workers specifically by name and not um, as a form of reprisal. So... It's a very complicated situation in terms of recognizing workers' rights to freedom of movement and recognizing the illegality and consequences of employers' actions while it's trying to navigate those two very particular tricky worlds in terms of the power dynamics. And I would always like say to people, we have to be exercising caution too because you know employers can be dangerous not knowing who we are or, or who anyone is coming on their farm. So just always being aware of that element of danger Uh, yeah, go ahead. Just on that. Yeah, I mean, the consulates usually are more worried about having the program cut off than they are about their own citizens. Um, a great example is there was a raid in 2006, one of the largest raids in Canadian history on a chicken farm. And they're mostly Thai workers. And the Thailand consulate showed up for a meeting with them and advised them all to just leave the country and go. So, the, and I, I mean, other people would know much better stories about the Niagara region, but I know the Mexican consulate down there works hand in hand with the government um, and in immigration enforcement. Uh, go ahead, uh, Connie. I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, the tip line. Um, what we understand or you know what we yeah what we understand is that workers who are in a situation abusive or exploitative situation can use the tip line uh but indirectly for example you know community workers outreach workers right now in place because of you know the support of this project uh, if we are in contact with these workers and they want to uh, report an allegation, he can do that by going through us. Uh, for example, I actually helped one, you know, uh, she didn't want to report herself because she doesn't want to jeopardize her employment and the ability to be able to come back next year. So I asked her the information. I phoned the tip line. And I, 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 I mentioned my name. So any, any communication or any further uh, question or follow up from the tip line, they should course it to me. And then I should talk to the worker and let her know, you know, what's happening. So in that case, we are protecting, you know, the worker. And at the same time, we are informing the government that this is happening. And it is there, you know, honest to follow up and to make sure or follow up, investigate and make sure that, you know, uh, whatever situation the worker or the workers in that uh, workplace, uh, they know that there is something, you know, being done. So uh, this is a tip to the tip line that, you know, we can, uh, we can, we can do, we can use uh, to, 
to support the worker and at the same time protect them. Okay. Um, and there's a question in the chat um, from Ashley. Have there been any moves towards permanent residency upon arrival? Is this a solution uh, with significant political support behind it? And that could go to any of the presenters in terms of um, shifting in uh, permanent residency. So I don't know that there's any formalized um, step that way. There has been recently a municipal nominee program, and, but uh, many of the newer programs that uh, introduce permanent residency pathways are not so accessible as they currently exist. Um, but I just noting that IRCC actually a couple of months back noted that they have projected goals for 2021 um, and that those projected goals, given the context of the pandemic, may not be achievable unless they start to open up pathways to people who are already here, specifically people who are here on the temporary foreign worker programs. So we do hear some talk of it at the federal level, but specifically as advancing um, you know, a mechanism for this program, the temporary foreign and agriculture, uh, not as yet, um, but uh, it is being discussed largely how Canada can meet its immigration goals in the context of COVID. And I think that also includes international students as part of that as well, um, caregivers um, in lots of different sectors under which people are coming over. And I think there are a lot of uh, <clears throat> talks about and who's eligible and how they can become a permanent resident, but being said and put it in papers in one thing and when it comes to reality, it's another thing. And how tough it is, <clears throat> with, especially with the caregivers program, it was an ongoing battle allowing them to have uh, the on, on arrival, uh, you know, for permanent status for caregivers, they have been and and there is no uh, straight answer to say. Oh, they they pretend or they say say something and then they make policies and po uh, process in place which just make it more difficult. One of the good example with the you know who is qualified to become a permanent resident, they're given a new pathway and they put so many barriers so you can't even imagine going there. Uh, so that's even 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 for the skill category, they are top. You know they're more of willing to give people who are highly qualified and skilled people than people who are here and doing the actual work and uh, you know supporting them when it comes to healthcare most of the caregivers are part of healthcare and they should give them a chance to be first one to get the permanent residence but it's not so so there are a lot of hope uh, there were a lot of talks let's hope and see something or the other, they will work out. And I think part of permanent residency is also international students. They are more willing to give that to international students than any other category, I guess. So. Um, I have a hand from uh, Carol Ann, if you wanna go ahead. Yours on you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that, you know, Minister Mendocino and, and Jennifer and Stephanie were saying this too, that uh, uh, he spoke recently about this exact issue and, and creating those pathways uh, to meet the immigration targets of IRCC, re most recently at the um, Metropolis National Conference. I think, you know, TNO does advocacy. Um, Kairos, uh, thank you, Connie. It's incredible the work that you're doing. And I think, you know, as long as we can continue to advocate together, um, uh, that it, it can have an impact. Um, uh, uh, so I, I encourage you to even read the uh, policy brief that was released. Uh, I shared it in the, in the chat from the Royal Society of Canada. There's some incredible recommendations there for IRCC that we can amplify um, in our messaging and um, advocacy efforts too. And they're gonna be releasing a policy brief specifically um, on migrant workers. So reach out, uh, make sure that all the work that um, we're all doing, that you're all doing um, can be you know, included potentially in that policy brief as well. Thank you. 
Um, and while we're on this subject, this is by no means uh, a closing. I just wanted to um, put this up now uh, while this is sort of the area we're discussing. Uh, the next webinar is going to be on the 20th of April, uh, and it's going to be around specifically what we can, what actions we can take um, as interested people um, to support migrant workers, um, like which organizations are uh, doing petitioning um, and how we can uh, sort of uh, share joy with migrant workers directly and sort of the issues around doing that as well. So I think this dovetails nicely with, um, with where we are on this topic. So um, the link to register is in the chat. Um, and I think hopefully that'll be a fruitful webinar, but let's continue with this webinar while we're, while we're here. Um, if, feel free to add more questions in the chat or if anybody has anything emerging from the conversation we've been having, feel free to uh, raise your hand as well. <laughs> trying to think of what questions I had sort of emerging from the uh, from these conversations as well. Um, there is quite there is quite a lot to take in both from Max presentation and the TO, TNO presentations in terms of um, uh, the issue is they're so it's so multifaceted. It's such a sort of large scope of issues. Um, intersecting, as you said, like at the bottom of the sort of pyramid of rights that should not be. Um, so I think it's important to uh, do what we can as interested people in um, as the, the permanent residents and citizens uh, to push for change. So I'm glad to see that there has been such an interest across all of these webinars in terms of, uh, in terms of interest in this topic. Yep, go ahead, Connie. I know I've been talking a lot, but also just <laughs> <laughs> go for <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, but um, under the current project, you know, that Kairos is implementing through coordinate, community coordinated approach and also with the partners that, you know, uh, we have TNO is a partner. Um, I, I see Fanny here, the Center for Migrant Farm, uh, Migrant Worker, sorry, uh, Migrant Farm Worker Solidarity in Simco and Christina is here with you know, uh, the, the Durham region, uh, Sandy and Ashley from, you know, the unknown neighbors in, in Simcoe County. Uh, we still have three months to go and we can still do a lot in terms, you know, within this three months uh, to really provide support to the workers who are needing information, needing emergency assistance, whether it's food or, you know, and, and I really want to encourage uh, supporters and allies who are here with us and who had been participating in the previous webinars, you know, that we have community partners in different uh, farming locations, farming areas, and, you know, to, to be able to connect with these partners and be able to know more information you know, from the migrant workers and on the ground and uh, finding ways uh, to be able to support, you know, and provide support to these workers. Having said that, I also don't want us to lose sight of the fundamental changes that we wanted to see happen within the program. Um, Mac has, uh, has, you know, spoken a lot about advocacies of different organizations that, and, and TNO uh, is part of those, you know, advocacies uh, that, that we can only, you know, see this change happen if we are all together. 
in, in, in doing the advocacy and for calling for the changes that we want to see happen. Now, a lot of, part of it is, on, is honest too on the workers for them to be able to speak up. But we have to understand that those who take, you know, the risk or taking the risk and the courage to speak up, uh, not many would want to do that because of the very nature of, you know, their situation, their vulnerability and why they are here. Uh, they are here as, you know, guests and welcome by the Canadian government under the Temporary Foreign Workers Program. And they should be accorded with all the rights and all the support and services that all of us should, you know, uh, that all of us have. So, so it's not really making that distinction in, in terms of the status and so forth, but it is happening, it is a reality. And what we're, hoping, what we're hoping to achieve, you know, from, from these conversations is to raise, increase that awareness. And hopefully at the end of the day, there are more of us calling for these changes and at the same time providing support. So I just wanted to, yeah. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> As one? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I think it's all, all really good, uh, Connie, what you mentioned about like providing support and at the end it's the community, right, that creates the laws and it does the changes in what is happening within um, the cities or, or the country that we live. At the end, those changes happen within the community, people from community that are supporting each other. Um, and talking about that and thinking about that, I have um, thinking like, it would be a possible way to try for the government that has implemented a, a kind of a service for outreach workers like myself. Like migrant, like farms should have visitation right. Like outreach workers should have visitation rights to different farms. Like, and the government help these organizations that have outreach workers to be able to do those visitation like visitation to different farms. I think that has always been a, a good idea. It would be a good idea. So it's not just through the inspectors of public health, but other people and other organizations that can have those access. I understand that farms sometimes are careful because of the crop or the produce that they are doing or growing like that. But if people are like um, trained in how to go, how to proceed, and they have a visitation right to farms, um, that would be a, a great way to go and provide services to, to, to farm, migrant farm workers. But how can that happen? How, I, I, I'm like wondering how it has not happened yet. And I think that's another piece of work that we need to work, all of us need to work hard to get that, or maybe to ask, lobby to the government and say, this is one of the things they could, you know, uh, give a chance to, to workers to see uh, this is another support because after the COVID uh, mental health uh, and, uh, you know, pe people being alone, it's a big thing. And how do we support when you don't have families? At least you have an outreach worker visiting and supporting. We've seen them in reality, how happy they wanted to talk to somebody and share your thoughts and giving that comfort. We've seen it in, in front and that's a ground reality, right? And then like Connie mentioned that we are all in, in together in this to support uh, and provide the support that unfortunately the, the our migrant friends who are on the bottom of it and we can empower them give the resources but at the same time there's nothing for them to act on it to safely and getting that support and and I think we need to work a little more harder to get that advocacy piece going more harder and holding our government accountable when you're bringing food chain is a huge thing in Ontario. I, I mean, I can only speak of it. it's a huge thing, how they are supporting the Canadian and also bringing the educational piece to our Canadian friends, looking at it as say, this migrant workers are how important our, in our daily life, you know, during this difficult time, you know, we were able to advocate for some other things. And this is another piece that we really need to push uh, our Canadian friends to look at it and see how important these migrant workers in our life on a daily basis and, and to have that educational piece also part of, you know, holding each one of us responsible and accountable for 
this work, right? And uh, without them, and I don't know how our life would be during the COVID and nobody think about it. And we only think about from the media perspective and saying these are the people creating problem. It's not actually they are in a worse condition and still they're working 18 hours, 19 hours to help us get our food on table. And we are getting all the produce and, and you know, so that uh, we were thinking along, how do we educate our gender population, our young uh, people and, you know, coming generations, how to educate them to support. So that's another piece of work. And I think whether the government funds or something, maybe we need to mobilize and, and see how that piece can be uh, go around in, in small communities uh, to support uh, at the same time, not to forget about the farmers. Also, they also go through struggle. At the same time, showing our support to them, saying how we can support them to keep the space safe for everyone, right? So, and I think it's a lot of work and it's a good beginning at least uh, and to take on. So that's my two cents. Thank you so much. Uh, Christina had a question. Yes, uh, actually, I would like to share a spirit in the how we start working here because I know that we're waiting for so long for legal change, but uh, I can say that we have to work right now with what we have. So um, they think that to get to the farmers, um, we have to use different strategies. Uh, we have to be uh, proactive to see which strategy works for every single farm. We approach sometimes the owners and if it doesn't work, we go straight to the managers. And um, this is how we try to make balance in order to get a goal to get service to the, to the, to the workers. So I will suggest to everybody who doing outreach and doing outreach myself, and we try to be uh, to to start talking with the owners. If that strategy doesn't work, we go with the manager and we go around to see which one works better. But for sure, we have to be able to uh, provide that service for the farmer who need the much. But we have to be smart in order to see how we can approach them. Uh, because we know the limitations, we know that right now is really hard, but we have to be positive and be proactive according with how we can approach them in the positive way that we can help the workers and at the same time get good relationship with the owners or the uh, farmers, uh, the, the farm, sorry, because in that way we can provide better service for the workers and this is what we want to let them know what we're doing what is their rights and how we can help them in this process so this is my my suggestion thank you hi can i say yeah that is a good idea we do that here at options we have very like with some employers we have a very good relationship we have even able to do training for the supervisor, how to treat farmer workers and about uh, cultural difference and all the stuff. It's, it's good when they, when, they don't see, when they don't see us. One minute, okay. Someone was asking me something. Okay, sorry. And yeah, we have a very good relationship with some employers and it's good when they don't see us as an enemy but they see us as a friend and that we are there to support them and support the the the, the workers no and for example right now we have like 30 40 people in quarantine from one of the farm and it's good when the employer let me know like we had this group in this hotel the other one in the other place how you can support them no and we can support them with food uh, calling them and do like a lot of stuff like and it's good when you had that relationship with the employer but for the experience i had before we try to um, to reach those uh the farm but they don't want us like it's very hard when they are like very close minded they don't want yeah, yeah. because they see us as, as enemy because they think that we're coming to organize the workers we're coming to 
unionize them or we are coming to tell them what are their rights what are they have to do that's that's the problem that they don't that they don't want people uh, like us organization get close to the workers because they they don't they don't want that they only want them to come work and that's it they don't want to have them for them to have any other like contact beside like only with the farm no like only with the workers from the farm but not outside the farm and yeah some some employers are very accessible and we can do a lot of stuff but other others don't don't let us get close to the workers i don't know that's a comment <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, Fanny, you can go ahead and we'll come back to Christina. You're on mute. Uh, yes, it's, it's right what Anna says. Um, uh, I think uh, the way that it, it's really hard. We had a lot of, of barriers that have to be overcome during this process. And um, I, we find now here in Durham region that um, if we know exactly what kind of farm and we know the problems that uh, any farm is representing because the farmers or the workers are telling us, you know, we have this kind of abuse or we have this kind of problem. Uh, what we're doing when we try to bring the, the groceries because we, do, we bring groceries as well, we provide them with a, I can say a carpet with a lot of information that we print, like you write, so this is how you're supposed to wash your hands, with a lot of information that we think it really help them. So I don't know, I know it's hard for us. I know that uh, we had a lot of problems to reach the workers, but um, what this is what we have right now, so it's just to be, positive and try to give them exactly what we what they need because we know the farmers we know the workers as well and we know the limitation is so we have to work with that it's just a, be a little proactive and positive that's it thank you uh, Annie, you can yeah, so we are doing the same thing here in the area of Norfolk County and Haldimand County we are um uh, approaching the farmers uh, with uh, the welcome bags. And we haven't had any problem um, with the farmers. And in fact, one of the big operations, uh, uh, they hired probably 400 people. They called me last week uh, to come over to the farm and bring some welcome bags for the workers. So I think um, if everybody worked together, even like, as the workers, the farmers, um, I had two farmers already uh, coming to to the office and uh, talking about you know the the problems they are having with uh, a ripe can and and uh, uh, all the issues with uh, uh, they're having right now. So um, and I think talking about a. Um, uh, the government of Canada, I think, should take responsibility of these workers, uh, facilitate centers or, or places where a worker, when they uh, come to town, uh, they can go to a place where they can probably get Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, talk to the families, um, uh, because some of them just come at one o'clock in the in the afternoon and then all day they just ha go around and around until eight nine o'clock at night uh, with they don't have anything to do so probably if uh, all of the groups push the government to you know uh, for that to happen it would be really nice big help for migrant workers Um, Catherine, did you have something to add or did you have a question? I just see that your, your mic is on. Yeah. Uh, how do I, how do I, am I muted? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. 
My concern, I, I support permanent res residency totally. How does a worker afford to live in Canada? How, I mean, we talk about this as if it's, they all want it and they'll bring their families and everybody will be happy. Well, who's going to pay for it? They can't. At $15 an hour uh, minimum wage. So it's a question. I want it to happen, but how is it going to happen? And I think that's a reality for people who are already here as a permanent resident with doctorates and engineering, highly qualified people who are driving taxis and uh, uh, working in Tim Hortons because they are so determined, right? Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, like you said, not everyone wants to be a permanent resident or they want it to be. People who are determined to be a permanent resident the the hard work they do and then when their families together and I think that makes more sense for them to work together and not knowing in in limbo not knowing what their status is make it more difficult for them and it's and when you become a permanent resident there are, there are add-on benefits for them to work hard because every permanent I mean every immigrant including myself, maybe I might came in 35 years ago, I never thought how difficult life will be in Canada, right? But we all work through. And I think that's one of the achievement of it. If you look at it, if you ask me, uh, yeah, $15 for an hour, even, I don't know, 70, 80% or 90% of a population, uh, most of us are living below poverty line, but somehow manage. But putting that as a barrier, I don't know whether... Uh, it's uh, people who wanted to be a, a permanent resident, somehow they will survive through this barrier also to make it as their home. And they will be more productive when you know your status and it's able to give them a peace of mind to work a little more harder to achieve what they need to achieve in life. Like they're not going to be maybe not staying at the $15, maybe we will work through on a higher wages. And then maybe government have to think about saying $15, it's enough when the, the given fact of life expect, you know, in, uh, expenses are going up and uh, to, to aggregate on next, right? So, uh, and I think giving a permanent residence gives them a more stable life than not having them on limbo like this and going through all the abuses. So it will take a lot of mental health uh, issues and um, in life in general, overall. Uh, life, it makes much, much uh, better when you have a permanent status uh, in the country than ha unknowing your status. And that, that's why the abuse happened, right? So uh, uh, I, I will argue on that side of it saying, yes, they might not offer to, but at least give them a peace of mind that they are, have a condition that not to, not to take all the abuses that goes on with that. So that's my okay. thought on it. And I would like to add to something what uh, just Jennifer said. Um, I would like to to, to remind uh, that these are very hard workers, right? They don't work regular hours like people do, like just like eight hours, seven hours per day. They work between 10 and 12 hours uh, and they love to work like that. So it's not people that are like, you know, just sitting down and they, they know what is work. They are hard workers. And like uh, Jennifer said, when they come with families, I think that the families are the same, like the wife or wherever they come, they are hard workers too. Their standards of living uh, might not be like um, very, they, they, they know how to live with little as well, right? So that's something, other things that we can take on consideration, but yes, and the possibilities of growing and don't have the, the repressals and no being um, under abuse, it will give them a chance to, to grow. Right, so I think um, that's something that it's, it's very important to consider. Um, and the other part is like, uh, there is always like uh, opportunities to grow when you learn the languages. Right now, they face a lot of barrier because they don't have supports for ESL classes or like in, in, in talking in general, right? But if they have access to education and all of that, I'm sure that they will look for those paths. I have like, a uh, I don't know, I, I concern about that too, because 
when you get the PR, then they they might not want to continue working at the farm because then they had a different status. They might be able to move to some other job. Then we would have the same issue because we have to bring more uh, farm workers. No, and that's something that will continue. Maybe that's why they don't allow this group to have PR because they know that when they had a PR, they will move to construction. They move, will move to a different job. No, and that's we create the same issue that we have right now that the locals don't want to work in this condition they don't want to work in the farm because it's, it's hard no that's why maybe that's why they don't allow them to have the PR because they know that people will move to a different uh, job no but I think that's we, what we need is like better condition for them and uh, that's that's what they need no like to have the support and, and better conditions for now no had her hand raised um, and we are getting to the to the end of the session um, so Connie if you wanted to raise your point and then we'll check with our speakers and then we'll be done for the day uh, thank you David uh, I just want to respond briefly to Catherine's question mm -hmm. I think aside from calling you know uh, for permanent residency status and for them to be really permanent residents, it's also um, a principled question, you know, or a principled call that it's not immigration or Canada or other governments who determines who could be a permanent resident and who shouldn't. I think uh, knowing, you know, the, uh, the limitations and the challenges and the barriers that people without status or people with, you know, uh, temporary status face, I think we want to create a fair playing field, you know, so that all of us human beings uh, shares and exercise, you know, uh, and benefits from our inherent rights. So I think, you know, that is uh, the, the principled uh, aspect in, in calling for permanent residency. And also, uh, it's not, uh, it's not, you know, every, as you said, Catherine, everyone that want that. So they have the option to say, no, I just want, mm -hmm. as, you know, as a, as a worker or open work permit, but they have that option to say no instead of them, instead of what's happening now, that everyone is going out of their names to be able to become permanent residents. And, and it's also pitting, you know, we're being pitted against each other mm -hmm. in terms of benefits, in terms of rights. And that is wrong. And that is, again, part of, you know, why we're calling for status for now, status for all. Um, we... Yes, I see Mark uh, racing. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, no, don't worry about it. Yeah, but also, in terms of, you know, if we're, if we're talking about logistics, if we're talking about finances and materials, um, for, let me just talk about the seasonal agricultural workers. The program has been there for six, almost 60 years now. And these workers have been paying to income tax, yep. EI, uh, and, and CPP. And they're not able to access, you know, uh, those benefits. And if all the temporary workers who are here, we're talking about hundreds of thousands. And how much are they contributing? Not only in terms of their work, not only in terms of their labor, but also financially. And yet we are not giving back, you know, them in terms of being able to access support and services, being able to help, you know, care, for example. So um, it's, you know, uh, uh, I hope uh, that um, kind of elaborates a little bit on why we're calling for permanent residency. Thank you for that, Connie. Um, I want to go to if there are any last points that our uh, guests want to make uh, as we get to three o'clock. So if uh, Jennifer, or Stephanie or Mac have anything to add. 
I just had a really short, short story about what Connie said with the divide and conquer kind of strategy, which is the city has historically divided those who are advocating for more shelter spaces for homeless against those who are advocating for more shelter spaces for refugees. And they've purposely set up a divide between them to try and get the two groups to fight each other so that they can try and get more money from the federal government for shelters. So yeah, it happens all the time and they're very good at it, unfortunately. And I think for my last piece of thing is, and I think we have a lot to learn and uh, educate each other on certain things and understanding our history and where we are all coming from and what circumstances. And I think it's a big piece, even though it's all falls on, on um, certain group of people or, uh, you know, expected of educating other rather than, you know, we all working together. And I think uh, we have a long way to go. And we, we learned, and I think I I'm, came from a colonized background to divide and conquer. It's always been a part of it, uh, of learn. Uh, we need to undo so many things, even in, within as an immigrant, I need to learn so many, un, undo things by myself to learn more and uh, to be more inclusive. And I think we have a long way to go. <clears throat> and I think we are stepping into one step at a time in the right direction and hoping this type of work will bring all of us together and bind us together to, to build up the nation that we all wanting to and we're wanting to see. So I will leave it as that. Mm. Thank you. Stephanie, anything to add before we close? I do not. I think we covered a lot in the last little while, and I guess yes. I will end it on, on Jennifer's note there and just thank Kairos again. Thanks to you, David, and to Connie and to Alfredo for your invitation today. This has been a great chance to, to connect with everyone. Thank you, everyone, for, um, like, thank you to our wonderful guest speakers. But um, what I appreciate about these webinars is just how much everyone has to offer to um, this very rich discussion on the uh, critically important issue. So thank you everybody um, for your insights into this. Um, I'm including the link to the April 20th uh, webinar again in the chat. Um, and thank you so much again. I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Take good care.